<laughs> they've thrown at this cast so many different genres and so many different obstacles. And like every single person here like goes above and beyond. So I, when I heard we were doing a musical, like I was not in the least concerned, just, I was very curious about what the story was going to be. And I think all of us, like we knew about the musical for so long, we were rehearsing, we were training, we were singing. Um, and then when we finally got the script, I'll never forget being there. And it was Anson. We were in the transporter room, I think. And I think I was with Babs. And Anson like looked up from the script and he was like, this is incredible. Like, this is really yeah, good. And I was I like, that. Anson said it. Oh, my goodness. What is about to happen? So we knew that the script was good and we knew that we were all going to pull it together. Um, and it was a blast. But I, yeah, I didn't get a full song. So just putting it out there. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Amy Ratcliffe, Editor-in-Chief at Nerdist. Thank you for joining us virtually for the sag After Foundation Conversation at Home Q&A. Today, I'll be speaking with the stars of the Paramount Plus original series, Star Trek Strange New Worlds. We have a lot of ground to cover, so please allow me to introduce the cast. We have with us today, Babs Alusan Mokun, who plays Joseph Mbinga, Melissa Navia, who plays Erica Ortegas, Christina Chong, who plays La'an Noonien Singh, Jess Bush, who plays Christina Chappell, Celia Rose Gooding, who plays Neota Uhura, Ethan Peck, who plays Spock, Rebecca Romaine, who plays Una Chen Riley, and last but not least, Captain Christopher Pike, played by Anson Mount. Oh, there are a lot of you. I'm so glad you're all here. Thank you. Hello. Good morning. Thank you for having us. Yeah. And congratulations, because you all just got nominated for Best Drama Series at the Critics' Choice Awards. So yes. huge congrats. And Celia got nominated for Best Supporting Actress and Best Drama Series. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Honored doesn't even begin to cover it. Yeah. Well, it is all well deserved. And you know, I want to dig in. So something I love about Star Trek that has been pure and really constant is that by discovering new worlds and civilizations, we're also always discovering more about ourselves and our humanity. Uh, and I feel like all of your characters went through that this season and also the crew as a whole. But before we get into all the the trauma and um, pain and self-reflection, I need to discuss Subspace, uh, Subspace Rhapsody, the first ever Star Trek musical episode, which four words I never thought I'd get to put in a sentence and yet now <laughs> cannot live without. <laughs> um, so I want to know initial reactions. Who was like so excited and who was like, oh, I'm excited. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I was incredibly excited. It was like it was one of my dreams to do that, to to be in a film or TV musical. So for me, it was like literally my career coming 360 and living out a dream we i'm going to say it was chrissy's fault that this all happened yeah <laughs> yeah i want to say it was her idea really <laughs> we'd, we'd kind of been we'd kind of been lobbying um the showrunners for um to do something like that for a while um i not because i'm a singer i'm definitely not as you can see but just like i like uh oh shit situations uh, I think they're really good for creativity. And the way that they scheduled it was even better because it came towards the end of a very long shoot season. And, and everybody was just, it was really, it was a really hard episode to do, as you can imagine. It requires, it required a lot of work on the weekends between recording the album and choreography, but everybody was super psyched to be at work every day. I would say some people were more psyched than others. That's for sure. <laughs> I, was, I was stoked. I was pumped. I, I was uh, stoked as well. Super yeah. stoked. But yeah, we performed to playback. I mean, we recorded everything. It was, we came in for dance choreography. Um, it was a real labor of love. It was very fun on the and weekend. Also what can I just say while well, Rebecca's there because it just prompted a memory I walked in to this first time I went to the recording studio I walked in on Rebecca singing she would she just I think you just finished singing recording keeping secrets and I walked into the studio and listened 
to the playback of her singing and I was just like had tears in my eyes I was like it was so amazing to see your fellow castmates like mm-hmm. doing something so incredible and out of the box for what we signed up to originally mm-hmm. was just yeah it was really amazing I was, it was very special <laughs> no you were skeptical of course like very on point <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean totally reflects who my character is as well but I was like Oh my gosh. I kept looking at Christina who was like, Oh my gosh. And I was like, Oh, I don't know. I don't know about that. <laughs> and uh, it just, I, I don't know. I was blown away by the whole experience. I was very moved by it. And singing is so hard. It's yeah. like seven hours to record a two minute song. Mm-hmm. I don't know how long it took you all, but it was like a very long onerous process. Yeah. It took me a long time as well. It definitely was a, such um it gave so much insight into like the craft of singing and and how like it's it's unbelievable it's so difficult and it requires so much um sensitivity and skill like honed honed skill which obviously kind of know like conceptually but when you try and do it you're like oh wow okay this is wild um and i just i don't know i was also blown away with how much they like they just had so much faith in us just blind faith. Just blind faith. Like, just like <laughs> they'll, they'll all get this. It's going to be okay. It, totally. We're like, yeah, totally. <laughs> and also we have like auto-tune technology. So so if anybody was truly tone deaf, I think we would have covered it fine. But we we lucked out with a group of, of people who, if they could not truly sing, it, it everyone put their best foot forward and really showed up and wanted to make it work. So I think that was really 80% of getting it done was really showing up and actually wanting to do it. So with this group, it- Be it, real, it the only one they didn't use auto-tune on was you. That is <laughs> categorically <laughs> false. <laughs> oh. But that was very generous of you. My character uh, did not get a full song and I am not bitter about it at all. <laughs> <laughs> However, I will remind everybody every season until <laughs> we do this again, but- the thing is, like, everybody worked so hard on every single song. Like, we did backtracking. We did, you know, we were in the studio. And then on set, like, I just loved how many of us actually sang, like, during songs. Like, I was belting the bits that I had, I belted. Um, and so it was just an absolute blast. But I was saying um, while I was on mute earlier uh, that... Uh, <laughs> That everything they've ever thrown at us, like they've they've <laughs> thrown at this cast so many different genres and so many different obstacles and like every single person here like goes above and beyond. So I when I heard we were doing a musical, like I was not in the least concerned. Just I was very curious about what the story was going to be, and I think all of us like we knew about the musical for so long. We were rehearsing, we were training, we were singing. Um, and then when we finally got the script, I'll never forget being there. And it was Anson. We were in the transporter room, I think. And I think I was with Babs. And Anson, like, looked up from the script and he was like, this is incredible. Like, this is really yeah, good. And I was I like, that. Anson said it. Oh, my goodness. What is about to happen? So we knew that the script was good and we knew that we were all going to pull it together. Um, and it was a blast. But, I, yeah, I didn't get a full song. So just putting it out there. No, when we... When we when it came out and we uh, the our album charted, uh, <laughs> our <laughs> album <Taylor> even <laughs> beat Taylor Swift one day. Uh, and Bobby, I'm Bobby, I'm Bobby. Yeah, Bobby yeah. Akiva sent us an all an email saying it's an idea that should not have worked, <laughs> 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 and somehow it did. It really did, and I followed. Fox journey through the whole thing because I'm like okay we'll see and then by the end when you, everyone's on the bridge doing your choreographed yeah. number and then the Klingon boy band comes in <laughs> it was so special way, I shamelessly forwarded yeah. forgive me Anson I yeah. shamelessly forwarded the message that you sent saying we had surpassed Barbie and Taylor Swift I shamelessly forwarded to everybody. And I'm like, yeah. and I'm barely singing, but we did this. <laughs> um, but by the way, the speaking of the the Klingon boy band, so 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 you know, when you do a when you do a show, um there's a lot of 
uh, you're getting a lot of opinions coming in at, at you from every direction. And this network, I have to say, has been really, really amazing about leaving us mostly alone uh, to try these crazy things. But the Klingon boy band was one thing where they went, hold on, hold <laughs> on. Uh, could it be something a little bit more serious, like that is more Klingon-like, like opera? And we were like, Klingons have opera. Like the plot point is that they're embarrassed. So why would they be embarrassed of doing opera? So we actually had to shoot two different versions of that scene to show them uh, that one worked and the other one just kind of didn't and so when they saw it they, they let us they let us get away with the the boy band thing and also shout out to bruce hammer who was in the boy yes. band yeah yeah it was so bruce good to see was was in the boy band so that was really fun to bring him back for that i think the operatic version is uh a a, a special added moment on this on the season two dvd so uh, if if folks are looking for where it is, it's somewhere. It's somewhere out there. On the B-side. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. This was my hope. I need all the versions. <laughs> They're available to you, Amy. They are. Thank you. Thank you. The boy band, though. Like, what a, what a gift. What The whole episode, what a gift. Um, I want to talk about another first for Star Trek, which y'all just did all over season two. But um, we had the special crossover episode with Lower Decks, which was so fun. And I want to hear about... Um, you know, the Cerritos crew, slightly different energy than mm-hmm. the Enterprise crew. Slightly, just uh, slightly different. Slightly. Um, so I'd love to talk about, you know, like having Jack Quaid there and Tawny Newsom and, and matching the, that really fast dialogue. For me, I, 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 I went around with them a lot because obviously security officer, big security threat. But obviously my character, completely opposite to what they were bringing. And I found it really hard in some takes to <laughs> like hold it together because the every take was different and they're so funny together. It was like free stand-up comedy for the entire episode. Um, so yeah, the fact that they are so different made my job harder, for sure. Well, we couldn't, the, the episode really could not uh, have happened without Jonathan Frakes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Who directs on both series. So he... He was really the perfect person uh, and with the, the deep knowledge of Trek uh, to be able to come in and help meld those two tones together. Um, it was really important that he was there at the helm of that. Yeah, obviously the the energy on an animated show voice wise is going to be different than on our show. So watching them figure out how to massage that with the help of Jonathan Frakes was crucial. Mm. Well, and- Speaking of Jonathan, I know, Ethan, I heard that uh, Jonathan made the the word Spoimler for the Spock and Broimler, like, bromance. What was it like working with Jack Quaid? Huh. Uh, indeed, Spoimler uh, is a Frakes invention. It was great working with Jack. Uh, it's so fun because his character is such a nervous fella, and Spock is so the opposite, and they make kind of a great yin and yang duo, in my opinion. I think Frakes kind of tried to hone in on that. But I'd actually met Jack quite a few years before and was was opining, I, I hope we get to work together someday. And this was just the most amazing venue to do that. And with Frakes. Uh, so it was it was a blast working with him. I love that. And similarly, I feel like, you know, Mariner and Uhura really had a connection. Um, Sally, what was it like pairing up with Tawny Newsome? I love Tawny Newsome so, so, so much. That's a friend for life now. So I'm very grateful to have an opportunity to work with her. Kind of like what uh, uh, Ethan said uh, with the yin and yang. I feel like Uhura season two is very book focused, very uh, uh, no no shenaniganry allowed. uh, And Mariner as a character is shenanigans full speed ahead and so having her be the one to bring out the more uh playful side of uhura i think is very important because when we're working in a prequel it's important to show the moments and the interactions and the and the events that mold the characters into the versions of them we'll recognize later and so the 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 playful nature of Uhura that she inherits that we see in the original series, I think it's really special to think that, oh, 
Mariner inspired that in her. And, and that relationship, this moment was the thing that sort of gave her freedom to let her very short hair down and, and just have a good time. <laughs> and Tawny is such a sunflower of a person. And so for her to be the one to bring that energy out of Uhura and also in turn bring that energy out of Celia, I just, I, I could talk about how much I love her and how grateful I am for her forever, but we have a finite amount of time. So just, I, I'm eternally grateful for that opportunity. I love that. It sounds like they brought just a real lightness to the set overall. That's delightful. Down. Yeah. Well, so we've had the crossover. We talked about that. We talked about the musical, but Melissa, to your point, Strange New Worlds, we go everywhere, everywhere, right? There's comedy. There's moments of absolute horror, um, fairy tale. So uh, I'd love to ask you, Melissa, like what it's been like getting to really stretch your acting muscles, um, kick off with you to explore the different genres that Strange New Worlds gets to step into. Sure. I've said this a lot. I mean, this is a dream role, I think, not just for me, but for all of us. Um, in terms of the fandom that we have from it, Star Trek has a really long, fantastic, diverse, uh, just groundbreaking legacy that we are continuing adding to and doing things that are the reason people keep coming back to Star Trek and then also doing things for the first time. And to do it with a cast like ours that is legitimately, I know I'm a bit biased because I love all these people on your screen at the moment, but is legitimately incredibly talented. Um, and then we get to, in every episode, tackle something new while also having this through line of our relationships, our characters' arcs, um, and also um, telling a story that people know of because you know, we come before the original series, right? So, so it's this, it's just this perfect meld of, of something that has existed and everyone loves and also a story that everyone wanted to know more of. And now we're getting to create that. And with the episodic nature of our show, it really does get to send us on an, a new adventure every week. So whether it's on the ship or it's on a new planet or, something wacky has happened, like we're singing in space. Um, we're just kind of able to almost have uh, a new take on our characters and also play new characters. Like in the first season, you know, we had an episode that was, you know, it, to someone who, what you know, if you were just to tune in, in a moment, it would look like we were suddenly at a Renaissance fair. But what it was, was this uh, beautifully crafted episode that was so um, meaningful, especially for, um, several of the characters, well, for all of our characters, but it was so meaningful on so on multiple levels. There's always a scientific explanation for why we are suddenly dressed uh, in in uh, in medieval garb, um, and again in space. But it, it allows us to do so many different things. As an actor, it is a dream role um, where you get to play really everything you wanted to play throughout your career, you get to do in a season. And uh, after season one, I was like, what can they possibly come up for season two, come up with for season two? And uh, and they have shown us. And now that we have been uh, renewed, many things to come in season three. So I'm going to go ahead and say it for season three. Get ready for some more Tagus. Yeah, more Tagus. Hashtag it. Let's more get Tagus. Hashtag more Tagus. Yeah. More Tagus with a solo uh musical performance yeah. yes yeah. <laughs> be careful what you wish for careful. and the funny thing too is like when i hear I, I absolutely it's been such uh so wonderful when you hear it from fans and i also you know hear it from you guys and i hear it from producers about how much everybody wants more of a character like that again as an actor i mean you could want nothing more and what my response always is is we have such a fantastic ensemble and we have 10 episodes a season. And the reason that every episode feels like a mini movie is because so much goes into it. And so what our writers have been able to do and our producers and our crew and our creative and our and our crew behind the scenes have been able to do is really pack so much into each episode where we're able to get storylines for, for all of us and then also our, our incredible guest stars. So uh, whenever anyone's like, you know, oh, we wanted, you know, more Ortegas in these last few episodes, I'm like, it is so difficult. And it truly is an ensemble show. Like, I don't know. I haven't heard it about any other shows. I do talk about this show more than I do about any other show. But like truly just like an ensemble of like everybody plays a part. And it feels like from the get go that you have known these characters for much longer than we have been on your screens. Yeah. 
And I like seeing like everyone gets their spot, like a spotlight, right? While you're also being on the enterprise together, usually figuring out problems, like having to solve problems very quickly in some sort of very stressful situation. <laughs> um, and I do want to ask you, I want to start digging into specific character questions. Um, Anson, I'd love to talk about uh, something I really liked about Pike this season. Well, two things. Well, several things, but I really like the kitchen upgrade. <laughs> I, re- I always love seeing more Pike cook because I, I think I've heard that you kind of brought that aspect to Pike in season one. Is that correct? Mm, kind of, sort of. So we do these, th- one of the things that, um, that, Akiva and Henry, our showrunners, are so good at is that they have um, occasionally they'll have meetings where they bring each one of us into the writer's room and just to talk character. And the first time that we did this before, while in the planning for season one, um, you know, it's a lot of them asking us questions, actually. And uh, I said, look, there's very few things about Pike that I know. And one of them is that when any crew member comes to see him with a concern, like everything else goes away. Like it's all about this person right in from front of him because that that's his greatest asset. He's smart enough to know that his crew is is really the engine that that runs the enterprise. And for s- some reason, that sparks an idea in Akiva who said he's getting, he said, I'm getting a picture of like, like maybe captain's table dinners. And I said, Oh, wait a second. What if, cause he, cause he can't take us, you know, he's a horse guy. So he can't, he can't take his horse on the enterprise. So Uh, what if, what if, you know, each captain gets one ask for their quarters, one special ask. And what if Pike's other thing is cooking? And so he asked for a kitchen. And Kiva said, that's it. We're I'm calling Jonathan Lee right now. We're getting you a kitchen. Uh-huh. And uh, I'm not sure how much Jonathan enjoyed getting that, that phone call in the middle of construction, but uh, they got a kitchen in there. And it's been great. It's turned out to be a very useful space. Did well, you yeah. also request the fireplace, Anson? Was that no, you? that was all Jonathan. Very I, real open that's so hot. Those are very hot days. <laughs> it's so hot, that fireplace. <laughs> Saying just a, a fireplace on a spaceship seems like yeah. When you're doing a scene and they say, "Okay, you stand, hot. you stand over here," and it happens to be right next to the fire. <laughs> our our many layers of costume that, was, that requires to be a Starfleet officer. I was going to say All those non breathable fabrics. Fabric. Fabric. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I'm like, that, that's not breathable. That's not going to be going to really layer face not melting off. <laughs> makeup mad because everybody's sweating (laughs) well and the other thing i wanted to ask about pike in season one we saw so much of him confronting his future and and worrying about what was going to happen and here um when he went to rigel seven he had to confront his past and a crew member who was left behind and of course everyone lost their memories it got complicated but what was it like exploring kind of pike's regrets well, first of all, I thought it was a brilliant idea for an episode, uh, both in terms of um, I love fan service, <laughs> you know, <laughs> giving giving the the old school fans uh, a little bit more of a taste of that that story uh, and filling in that story a little bit more. Um, and I thought I think it also worked for where Pipe was at that time and his his development. Um, I thought that, um, I thought it was a beautifully designed episode and especially in the, in the writing the the, this idea of, of, you know, the nemesis being the loss of, um, the expertise of the crew itself is such an insidious idea that had never been, nobody had ever come up with that before. And I just thought it was such a smart idea for a, for a nemesis is is the loss of our of the real engine of the enterprise which is the crew's expertise yeah it was uh a fun journey to uh, i mean a hard journey to watch but like even with ortegas like having to remember that she was the well the ship told her to that she was the pilot and just like <laughs> yeah fuck up and be like well the ship's in peril i guess i'm gonna do and that was a she had a she had a she had a solo scene in that in her own quarters where she's wrestling with 
this idea that came off so well. It is because when you read the script, it was like, it's just, I am Erica Ortegas and I fly the ship. And it's just repeated in the scene. But but she found all these different layers in it. And there's one moment I laughed out loud when when in the middle of it all, you went, I'm Erica Ortegas and I fly the ship. <laughs> 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 I love that. It was it was just it was such a fun scene to play. And that whole episode, like what we've heard from from fans is is what we intended. But it's um, one of the very cool things is I always like to say that like fans and, and the audience really are the second half of this experiment of the Star Trek experiment, like because they add all these additional layers on. And they said that in terms of that episode, what it spoke to them so much was one legitimate memory loss and, and the fear of that and how it is a disease that happens to people and, and what it's also like when you forget what it is that, that makes you, you. And like Anson saying, like our expertise that makes this all possible. If you forget the thing that, that, that makes your life to you valid, then what are you? And having to rediscover that maybe that thing you thought you weren't so great at, not only were you great at it, but you're the only person who can do it the way that you can. And so for me, when we were going through that episode, like it really resonated for me as well. And I think, that's what I channeled in that scene when I, same thing, Anson, I was looking at that page. I was like, what do I do? It's like an acting exercise. It was like 20 times the same thing. And then they're like, then you'll be here. Then you'll be there. And I'm like, what are you guys doing to me? And so, um, so that was like a group effort and uh, I'm happy it came off the way it did, but it really did feel like we do what we do for a reason. And there's a reason we've been tasked to do it. And so, uh, so yeah, so um, it spoke to me. It was beautiful to watch. And on the flip side of that, you know, that episode was about losing memories. And then I feel like Christina with La'an, some of her like hardest moments came from remembering something no one else knows about. So she, we saw so much more of her vulnerable side this season. And I would love to hear from you about exploring that. And also I would really like La'an to have and hold a good thing. <laughs> Hopefully, who knows, maybe this season. But um, but yeah, that was um, what the most difficult thing about her journey this season for me was where to pitch it because she's just been so, you know, closed off and and straight laced. I was it was knowing and we shot episode three out of order. I think we shot the last scene first, and the first day was the last scene, and the first kissing scene with Paul. So it's kind of like the top and tail of the episode. So after that, it was always like judging how, and I remember the kissing scene, I I, I did it so many times. And then, <laughs> and then like take 20, we're like, hang on, we're do going the wrong way with this. Maybe we should like, maybe she needs to be a bit more, a bit, a bit less out there and open, bring, bring that back to La'an La'an. You know, it was trying to find that with Amanda and, and Anitra was there as well helping. Um, so yeah, it was, it was tricky. And then even after episode three, I think there was episode six or something where, is that the one where Kirk's outside waiting for you, Celia? Kirk's outside sick bay waiting for you. I guess you would uh, That's episode six. Yeah. And I think even that scene, I remember that scene taking me ages to get the pitch, pitch at the right level. I, I literally we had to. I think it was Dan Liu who who directed that, and I was like, I'm so sorry. I don't normally take 20, 20 takes, but like, I just couldn't get the right level of where she was emotionally. Um, so yeah, so it was it was tricky for me, but really nice to allow that vulnerability to come out at the end of episode three, and then also with you know Kirk in and the musical episode as well, and obviously now. He's got a, a wife and a baby, so who knows? Minor detail. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Minor yeah. Detail. yeah. So it'll be interesting to see where she goes this season. I don't really know, like where where I don't know what I'm going to do with her. Where am I going to pitch her? I have no idea. <laughs> I find out next week, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I will keep putting it into the universe that she deserves good things. Yeah. And to keep the good things. Um. It was really cool to see that side of her. And of course, like self-discovery was a common theme for, for all the characters. And um, Babs and Jess, I'd love to talk to you about, we learned more, um, Melissa too with Ortegas about the characters' histories with the Klingon war and having a Klingon ambassador aboard brought a lot of things up. 
um, especially from Mbinga. And I'd love to hear from you, Babs, about exploring. I feel like, first of all, you broke my heart in season one with Medieval Wardrobe in Space episode. Mm -hmm. Um, And this was another really powerful uh, development for your character. Yeah. Um, You know, actually, before the first season, before we started shooting the first season, Akiva had said to me, he used to be a man of violence, you know, uh, something along those lines. And uh, so I had wondered, you know, um, what could have brought that about, you know, and uh, I'd sort of gone towards this direction of, yes, he was, you know, he was a man consumed by war at some point. And so that was already, you know, getting layered into what he was in the first season, you know, and then in the second season, you know, we just uh, unlayered some of that, you know. Um, It was a beautiful script uh, to get, you know, um, from Davy Perez. And um, it was just this journey of going deep into the psyche and the past of, you know, Dr. Mbenga and, you know, and him finding a way to, to really, to really walk out of the darkness, but going back into the darkness, of course, we did in season two and just exploring that and the depths of that and, you know, and his reluctance to be involved and, how he had tried to get out, but he kept being pulled back in. Um, yeah, it was it was a it was a wonderful challenge, and it was really really beautiful uh, to explore. Uh, there was quite a bit left on the cutting room floor, as as it so happens for these things. But uh, but I really 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 appreciated uh, the script. Uh, that I received for that episode. And um, yeah, there's a lot in there from Benga. And I think we're going to be discovering more in the future. Uh, perhaps it takes a bit of a break, you know, because of the wild swings he's had so far, you know, but that was a real, it was a real blessing uh, to go through the journey of, of season two with him. And going back to, the Lotus Eaters uh, that Anson and Melissa were talking about. That was indeed an amazing act and experience to wipe your brain out and wipe your experience out and knowledge and what are you? You know, you wake up in this cage and are you a child? You know, uh, I sort of try to play with that idea, you know. Um, so, yeah, it's it's uh, it's a real, real wonderful treat um, to to walk in the shoes of this character. And, you know, I'm sure my castmates feel the same way about their characters. And the, um, I think the showrunners and the writers have been, I think they've been honorable enough to spread the wealth. And I think that's very important because there's eight of us and it would really, 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 really suck to be standing on the sidelines, you know, uh, throughout and having, Pitter patter sort of dialogue and whatnot. You know, so to go through what I went through in episode in season one and have, you know, uh what I went through in season two for me was just uh is just a beautiful blessing. Yeah, there's complexity with everyone's characters. And that's something I, I realized even more when I was preparing, like revisiting season two. I'm like, I could talk to each of you for an hour about your characters. And I think it's really wonderful that everyone gets that, you know, that every character gets that attention. Um, and I do want to talk about, uh, Jess, I want to talk about Chapel because there was, of course, everything with the war, um, learning her, more of her backstory, and then uh, finally pursuing the, a romance with Spock. Um, yeah. Really going from uh, both ends of this, like from Spider- <laughs> one side to the other. Yeah, it was actually really interesting. Um, when we were shooting the Klingon War episode, there was overlap with the musical. So like, and I was 
I had a, you know I had quite a big number in the musical and also was quite heavy in in the Klingon episode. So there was days where I would come from from the AR wall where we had like explosions and medical like you know we were operating on somebody who was um, hanging on by a thread. And then I would go straight from there to go and practice being lifted up by six dancers and being spun around in the air. So, which I, at first I was like, crap, that's going to be an interesting mm. um, transition. But it was actually kind of perfect. It was really good to like just cut through the intensity and kind of keep my body in this like healthy <laughs> place. Um, yeah, it's, it was, yeah, season two for me was uh wonderfully challenging and stretching in in so many ways and on on what babs was uh, speaking about with episode eight i also just wanted to shout out to jeff bird the director of that episode yeah, because he was like we just I, he was perfect for that like he was such a perfect yeah. director for that episode he was yeah. so patient and um just so generous with allowing us to go as deep and intellectual and bodily and kind of just you know look at it from every single angle and really pull it apart and nut it out and talk and talk and talk and talk to find the truth of that complex experience yeah. absolutely. and absolutely like we we really made this beautiful little team with Davey as well like everyone was so passionate about doing that right and they made it feel so safe for me and I think for, I won't speak to you Babs but I felt like you, we, all, we all felt very safe in that which I think Absolutely. was really really important for that subject matter yeah. um and yeah. um yeah for me it was the, the standout experience in that was um discovering the depths of Chapel and and Benga's connection, mm -hmm. um, and where the genesis of that, and it's a it's a really unique bond. I think that they have it's kind of familial. Like there's something about it that's like really nonverbal and very intimate. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's like a protector slash mental. You know, it's just yeah, and I think that understanding where that's come from in such a in such a holistic and deep way was was so illuminating and satisfying and has brought so much depth to that yeah. for me um yeah it was a very very special experience that episode for me um unforgettable mm. yeah it was really beautiful to watch and chapel um you know ethan chapel really brought out uh, a very playful side in Spock this season and of course you had a whole episode where Spock's Vulcan DNA was removed he was entirely human um and Spock's always had a sense of humor about him but that episode was like so funny up in tears <laughs> oh so happy to hear that yeah yeah what was it like uh, playing that part of Spock up so I, much so when I read that it, it requires a, a tiny bit of context so when I first got this role obviously I was like oh fuck like this is a this is a major <laughs> this is a major experience that i'm going to be having this is a very important character to a lot of people and so when i get scripts like in the first season the body swap episode is sort of like season one's charades in my opinion for me and this was another one of those scripts that i got where i was like oh boy this is going to be a terrifying experience because i need to honor this character and then do something that's never the character i suppose and so really fun i mean again i just have such an amazing cast to work with and i feel safe working with them and the director from canning was really game to play and sort of understood what i was wanting to do with with that version of spock which was how far can we take him uh, from who he is, but still recognize Spock in him. And it's sort of, uh, 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 yeah, an exercise in, in daringness in a way. Um, 
And yeah, to speak to Chapel's involvement with Spock, Spock has these teachers that teach him about his humanness throughout his life. Mm -hmm. And Chapel's one of them. And that's a really special connection. And uh, Jess is so wonderful to work with and uh, informing as well of, of the performance, right? Like the, the, the characters don't exist without each other. So uh, it was so fun to do that with, with her. And uh, yeah, it, what was that like for you, Jess? Oh, it was, it was, uh, I mean, for Chapel, it was delightful. Like finally, like meeting, meeting Spock in his human form was like, um, uh, what's, uh, what's the word? Uh, it was, it was like a, a, a guilty pleasure being able to engage with you fully on a human level is just like, oh my God, like all this information that I've been trying to like get out of you is just like coming at me like a fire hose and um yeah it was very enjoyable <laughs> yeah it was funny at, at the end of that episode i was really kind of heartbroken to say goodbye to human spock because yeah. all these things sort of exist beneath the surface and yeah. so to really like wear them uh wear them on his sleeve was such a relief and then to have to yeah. put it all back away was was really sad for me it was it was a really interesting experience Really wonderful. And again, so grateful for that script and so appreciated receiving that. Ethan, I have a question. <clears throat> does um Yes, Spock, Rebecca. Yes. Does Spock <laughs> uh remember what it felt like to be human Spock? Ooh. Rebecca, that's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so that's something that I'm I'm kind of rolling around in my brain as we as we head into season three, is how much how human is Spock now on his path to becoming Leonard Nimoy Spock at the beginning of the original series? Uh, how human is he? And I'm thinking about this the other day with Chris Fisher, our directing producer, and I think he remembers all of it. Um, but it's like it's like it's having a, it's like he's taking drugs and he's had this otherworldly experience, and so he can't really quite inhabit it like he used to. But there'll still be the information, I imagine. I like that. Well, Rebecca, I have a question for you. Uh, the season started, of course, with Una, Una's trial, and we learned more about her history and more about the Illyrians. Um, what was it like for you to get to dig that much more into the character? Well, it was a real uh, honor to get to take on one of the legacy courtroom dramas for Star Trek. Um, Una had spent the first season and probably for years before the first season with years of shame, carrying around this terrible secret of being a genetically modified Illyrian, uh, which is not allowed in Starfleet and um, putting Capt Captain Pike at risk for giving her asylum. Um, so to be able to go through the courtroom drama at the beginning of season two and um, shed that burden um i think is a real turn for her character for the rest of season two and moving forward to get to get rid of that burden of shame yes and i bet it was amazing to work with yatita badaki like what a she was unbelievable what an unbelievable partner and valerie yes. weiss really the three of us just um we had we really bonded over that that episode yeah it was powerful and that theme kind of continued to, I feel like, you know, Uhura is really the heartbeat of the ship and she processed a lot about Hemmer, the loss of Hemmer this season. And, um, you know, had that beautiful, beautiful song in the musical episode kind of about her past. Uh, how, like, how did you take her in that direction this season? Oh, goodness. Um, that's a great question. I, I think her journey it followed the logical steps of grief and mourning i think i put a lot of my journey with being young and having to grieve loved ones earlier than an age that is fair uh i a lot of it was just me turning inward and doing a lot of uh, what's that word? Uh, uh, what archaeologists do, like es uh, excavating? Excavating. Excavating. excavating, excavating. Yes, nice. a lot of of pulling away that dirt and 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 being very precious with the bones of her feelings. Mm -hmm. And my journey with her was just trying to remain honest, and then doing the actor thing of knowing 
the future version of herself, but having to abandon it and and knowing that she becomes this person, this this very joyful, very graceful, very knowledgeable person. But what we do in a prequel is is getting us from point A, explaining how we got to point B from point A. And Uhura's story is filled with a lot of mourning. She she mourns her parents, her family, her best friend, but also the life that she lived before she was a Starfleet officer, when her family was still around. I, I think often about who Uhura was as a young teenager with her family, with her brother, with her friends, uh, 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 what her life was like, and returning to that version of herself that looks a lot like the future version of herself in the mess hall singing with Spock playing the, is it the lyre or is it the lute? What is it called? Yeah. That, that, that instrument, good. <laughs> um, the uh, thing with uh, the strings. <laughs> string something, harpsichord maybe. Um, her journey is uh, uh, really, it makes sense for her to still be recovering from the uh, uh, from the loss in season one and then in season two, having that be the thing that haunts her. It really is a story of having to take care of your human so that you can be the officer you want to be. And Uhura's instincts is to sort of just shovel it down and put it away and not really talk about it because she has a job to do and she has people to impress. And so much of that is a lot of what Celia the person uh, uh, feels like they have to do sometimes. And it was very cathartic and it was almost, it felt like a reminder from the universe of like, it's possible to do both of those things at once. It's possible to show up for your crew. It's possible to show up for your true family while also tending to yourself. And only after you, do the tending and the 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 healing that is when you can sort of reach the point that she was trying to speed run to which is just being okay whatever that means uh uh i think it was just really cathartic and really helpful for me i remember going to the director of that uh episode 206 dan liu and just being very point blank and being like, who bribed my therapist and who was making me do the hard work <laughs> in front of cameras? Who's doing that? Um, and he really just shepherded me and and really held me and, and was very conscious of the fact that it was very difficult for me to go to this place. And Paul Wesley, our Kirk, he was such a perfect springboard he was such a a a really just open player and somebody who really kept Uhura from really spiraling and hitting rock bottom he was someone who was constantly keeping her intellectually activated and that's where uh, my Uhura feels very safe in her cerebral place and I could talk about her journey forever but that was I still think about it and it still informs me because it's 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 something that's going to be informing Uhura's life for the rest of the series, however many seasons we shoot. This that episode and this moment in her relationship with Hemmer and her budding relationship with Kirk, it's gonna inform the rest of her journey. And I I'm excited to see the parts of it that she may want to hide or the parts of it that reveal themselves to her as she continues to grow and continue to grow into the version that the version of Uhura that we know in the future. Well, I can't wait to see that. Um, and I know we talked about all of your characters. And as we head towards the end of the conversation, I want to talk about something the crew has to commonly face, which is the Gorn, which have become absolutely terrifying nightmare fuel. Um, what's it, you know, especially in the season finale, the season two finale, we saw that that's the big threat. What was it like working against like the animate and uh, animatronics, the puppetry, like, CG coming in later. Well, mm. that that um scene with Spock and Chapel in the um like zero gravity kind of broken Cayuga moment that took two days. Like it was, it's very like it was so technical and there's so many moving parts and so much of it was 
purely imagination. Like we didn't have anything to look at. It was all just like, now it's there, now it's there, this is happening, like 10 different points in a take. So it was like, it was, I found it really fascinating and really fun because it was also like, harnesses and flying and spacesuits and like all the bits and pieces, all the bits at once. Um, it was a really great like end to the season um, as an experience. Um, but it was also very challenging. And also, yeah, I mean, meeting an adult Gorn in, in like the actual adult Gorn suit was unbelievable. It was so amazing. It was so cool to like, it had like, I don't know, Ethan, it ha- they had a puppeteer that was like operating parts of it right like yeah it's such a complex mechanism a very yeah. brave and durable stunt person wears this enormously <laughs> heavy suit and then there's a team of technicians that are controlling its expressions and it was crazy to look into its face and it be like yeah expressing and looking at you and it felt very present i mean one of the amazing things about our show is that so many of the effects are practical yeah, yeah. And that's for for us because you don't have to again fill in so much with your imagination. But yeah, yeah. that that Gorn was uh, freaky. He had like his lips would like peel back and stuff, like so yeah, weird. It, it was very expressive. Yeah. <laughs> well, meanwhile, like on the planet with the Gorn, like we were all there with all of it. Like it was there was the you know our crew did a phenomenal job of we had blood and guts and fire and darkness and just it was a bit too real and also perfect um but we were we were out there and i kept laughing because the whole thing with ortegas was she spends all season and the season before being like i want to go to a planet finally send her to a planet and it this is not this was not the planet that she wanted (laughs) you know she wanted more you know water and sunshine and you know adventure horses but no it was all darkness and death and giant lizards so but it was all real and it's all there and um yeah it was uh yeah like you said nightmare fuel i i just felt i feel very fortunate to be uh working on track at a time when we can finally do the gorn um it was an it was an uh, you know there it's it's um iconic uh race in the star trek canon and um, you know, if you the literature, they're like, they're everywhere, <laughs> you know, they're all over the place, but they're very hard to do, um, in, in scripted live action scripted form. And so it just, when I, when I found out that the writers wanted to tackle it, I was so excited because I felt like it, it just, the, um, just the hubris of saying, okay, let's do, let's do the Gorn um it, it both that and the and the there's kind of a their playful kitschy side of trek that that the gorn really embodies that um that kind of felt right for us as well um and but we obviously we didn't go for the kitschy we went for the terrifying and and i think i i think that our our crew especially our our, our special effects teams and our cg artists have really done a bang-up job yeah they really delivered on you know after seeing laon's like history with them or hearing about it all of season one and then meeting them and continuing to encounter uh like yeah no wonder laon is so traumatized nostalgically though when we think about the gorn we like to think about the original from the original series that that's what we're fighting (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> just like the kind of really slow moving disco bar. Like there's a season in uh, there's this episode in season one where it's just a beautifully done episode where it's essentially like it, it kind of like feels like a submarine film in that we are being chased by the Gorn, but you never see them. And I love it because every time Laon, every time Chrissy said the Gorn, like Ooh. I got goosebumps on set because the only none of us had seen the Gorn, the only character that's seen them is her. Um, and, and every time she's just like the Gorn, like, we're all like, what? And you spend the whole episode, (laughs) you're chasing us, but that fear is already instilled in the writing and in, in, um, in the plot that they're, that you don't want to be caught by this thing that you hear just the most horrible stories about. But then in the back of my mind, I would sometimes think, but wouldn't it be great after all this, when we finally, finally see them, they are. TOS Gorn. <laughs> that is 
they're running from. <laughs> Still feel like that would have been an avenue we could have gone down. Mm-hmm. It would have been an entertaining one. Yes. For sure. <laughs> um, and so I could talk to you uh, all for hours, but I do need to ask my last question. Um, Anson, you know, we're all excited that we get season three of Strange New Worlds. What can you tell us about the continued adventures of the Enterprise? Oh, man, why can ask me this? Because, <laughs> um, you know, the answer is like nothing I can tell you because like they, and it's in my contract to get to cut off a finger if, if I if I tell you anything. Ask Jonathan Frakes. He lets stuff slip a lot. He's missing a whole hand. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Very good. Ortega's is, is happening in season. We're under the bus. <laughs> what the hell? They also don't really tell us. We don't they, know. I can't. Yeah, well, I can't they tell us. I can tell you that the the genre conversation has continued, and and what's interesting is that um, I I, be, I believe the strike is, is what got in the way in the, of our of our between seasons conversations. And so when we came back to the table and Akiva says, hey, this is what we've got planned. I was amazed that there were a couple of ideas in there that I was like, that came like right out of my notes of that stuff I was going to pitch. Um, and uh, it's, it's a, there's some really fun ideas uh, and some really good character development that um, we're all excited to tackle. Awesome. It's a full like musical season. How's that? Yeah, a whole musical season. That's what I want. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thank you all so, so much for, for talking today and hanging out. It was a delight to speak with you all. And for those of you at home, seasons one and two of Star Trek Strange New Worlds are currently streaming on Paramount+. Plus. <laughs>